Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Eric Kostelnik. Eric is the uh, Eric is the founder and CEO of Postal.io. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Hey, John. How's it going? Very well, apart from mispronouncing your uh, your name in the intro. But uh, we are we say that it's real, real conversations. Just uh, just keeping it real. Um, <laughs> Eric, first you're not of the all, first. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, first of all, can you tell uh, our listeners 
a little bit about what you do at postal.io and, and also specifically as founder and CEO. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Postal is a offline marketing automation platform that helps companies uh, engage in the offline with their prospects, with their clients and their employees. Um, and we started the business about three years ago. Uh, the, you know, I was the founder and CEO of the, of the business. I co-founded it with uh, my, my CTO and, and, uh, and business partner who I ran my last business with as well. Um, his name is Jed Danner. And, you know, ultimately we're, you know, dedicated to, to solving the, the, the opportunity of automating and tracking and, and creating, you know, a massive pipeline for, for businesses through the offline. Love it. I, I think, um, uh, I mean, one observation that I'd have uh, about your organization and what you do is that some people um, may not understand the importance of offline um, in today, but I actually think with how much digital saturation there is, from my experience anyway, offline, like just in my own work with my own clients, offline yeah. has become more powerful, like if you can do it well. So I, I can see why your business is... Um, is already so successful and and uh, definitely we'll make sure at the end of the episode um we'll make it really clear for where people can can get in touch find out more about um you but also about the company if just in case you know i like to think there might be someone just jogging right now by the river somewhere in the world who goes <laughs> oh man that's exactly what i need for my business so um before we get there I, i'd love to know a bit about your story eric let's start with your childhood you know growing up what are some of the moments from that season of your life or themes even that really shaped you to become the leader you are today? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And a lot of times in these podcasts, you don't start at the beginning, you know, you kind of start at, you know, after college or in college and, and uh, your professional career. But I, I really do think that people's, you know, youth defines who they are in, in, in their adulthood and in their personal and their professional lives. And, you know, my, my, my youth, you know, I, I had extremely loving parents, you know, we, we, they were always looking out the best for, for me and my, my brother. Um, but, you know, we did move a, a lot. They were uneducated, uh, not college educated. They were ex extremely educated, just street smart educated. And so um, that being said, you know, the we, we, we traveled around the United States uh, my first 13 years of my life quite a bit. Um, and we're a bit of nomads um, for, for some time and ended up in, in an area outside of Philadelphia, New Jersey. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, when I was about 13 and spent my middle school and, and high school career there, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I think what what really defined me during that period of time is that it forced me to be in a situation where I had to make friends and and continuously connect with people. And I think that you know, people that are forced in that situation at a young age, they they turn out to be pretty good salespeople. Uh, it flexes your it flexes your sales uh, DNA, and it also creates a lot of resiliency um, with with folks because. You know, when you are the the new the new person in class or in, in a friend group, or uh, and I'm six six, so I'm a really big human being to begin with, and I was always the biggest in my class. And so, you know, you really have to make sure that you, know, you either are becoming a wallflower and, and kind of fading back, or you're using it to your advantage and 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 uh, and, and being uh, being a leader uh, and try to get yourself out there. So I think you know that that movement as a child really set my path as far as. Um, you know, why to become in my adulthood. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's funny how often that comes up, you know, it, it's it's definitely uh, probably um, one of the most common themes that comes up is is moving around and, and being, being forced by circumstance to learn how to break into new friend groups and, and re sort of socialize again and again and again. Um, so what, what have you learned uh, obviously, your the business that you do is is marketing and um, mm -hmm. and sales. Companies will be coming to you because they they want to grow the number of leads, quality leads, and 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 grow their client list and those sort of yeah. numbers. So, what have you learned from that upbringing, like you already described, that you can see in your approach to marketing and sales now? Yeah, I mean, so so first off, the 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 approach of just. I think it's interesting to ask this question because I think there's a lot of similarities between, you know, your networking individually and then your networking on the professional side of things. And there, it's not a coincidence that the LinkedIn and Facebook came up together, right? When you talk about what Reed did and talk about what Mark did, you know, they essentially were attacking two business, two opportunities, business opportunities, but going after 
you know, the personal versus the professional. And so, you know, you're going to draw so many different correlations between, you know, how people interact in a personal setting and how they're interacting and, and, and try to execute a goal within the professional side. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, when you think about in the personal side of things and, and trying to figure out, hey, how am I going to find someone to date? How am I going to find somebody to hang out with? How am I going to find the sports team or the, the athletics that I'm going to perform at or the, the, the musical instrument that I'm going to perform with? All of those different things I went through. You know, I, I tried all these different instruments of music. I tried all these different friend groups. I tried these all these different sports. And ultimately, you land on what is going to be you know, defining to you and what you enjoy and what you want to spend time and, and get your 10,000 hours in. And for me, that that ended up being basketball, guitar, and ultimately, um, you know, finding a friend group that, that was amazing that I knew would help me in, in my future. But that that didn't happen until 13 years, 15 years later um, in, in when I started. I mean, there's a lot of trials and tribulations in that. Wow. And when you look at that on the business side of things, it's the same exact thing. It's like, you're just out of college and you're trying to figure out, hey, who are my friend groups who are my network that can get me to where I want to be? What are the types of jobs that I want to have out there? I'm going to try a bunch of stuff. And then ultimately, you know, what is my path? What am I going to focus on? And, and, and especially when you start in business, you, know, you generally don't have an idea of where you're going to end up. And entrepreneurs, you know, there's a lot of just like early entrepreneurs that just knew they're going to be entrepreneurs right from the beginning. I think there's a lot of people that are aspirational and say, I want to be an entrepreneur. But in the, reality some of the best entrepreneurs in the world never really wanted to be an entrepreneur they just saw an opportunity and they were opportunistic and 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 wanted to execute that opportunity for me it was a little bit of both i always loved being a leader i always loved creating you know connections with people helping people get better ensure that that one person i've always adopted this one percent uh, on a daily basis just getting better educating yourself helping other people educate themselves and if you're able to do that then you get into a, 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 a into a good network and, and get into a good industry then you ha like you have this massive opportunity to really you know define who you are and where you're going on 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 the professional side and so that's how i think they're that that's how i think mm. they're they're correlated yeah absolutely no no thank you thank you for sharing that i think that's a really interesting take uh, what about leadership opportunities when you reflect on your early years right through to college and and beyond uh, it might be in basketball, it might be in music, or it might be in uh, in college or in work. Can you recall some of your first opportunities where you were leading a project or you were managing people or you were, you know, casting vision and now you look back and go, yeah, that was probably one of my first real opportunities to, to lead? Yeah, I mean, I I was always... I was always a leader in, in sports. So I, you know, I, I was always leading basketball teams or coaching basketball teams at a very early age. So I was always super involved as, as a leader uh, and a captain and all those, all those, you know, things that, that you do in basketball at, at an early age, you know, from 13 on. Um, and I always wanted to coach my little brother and coach my other, you know, other teammates, little brothers, and, and ultimately like be just the, the guy that could help. And I, that was kind of just the, early on kind of who I was, um, I was trying to flex that muscle of, I want to be a trainer. I want to, you know, coach people up and, and get them successful, um, which has carried through. Um, but I'd have to say like the first true leadership, um, opportunity I had was, was being my class president in college. You know, I had, um, I gotten a scholarship to play basketball in college and very early, you know, in that season, I just decided it wasn't for me. And, you know, my parents had spent the last, four years dedicating our life to getting me a scholarship because that was the only way that I was going to go to college. And, you know, it took me about a month and a half to be like, you know, this is not going to be for me. I, I just, I don't want to play college basketball anymore. And so it, whether it was like, I got to fill the space with something else, or I, I have to like, just figure out like, to make my parents happier that I did this, that I was like, I have to do something big. And so I ended up saying, I'm just going to be the class president. So I, I ran and, you know, our class was about 2000, 3000 people and you know, ran against some great people and ended up becoming class president. And it was interesting because, you know, when I was, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just big and loud and had ideas and very similar to who I am today, which I, you, my friends and my network will tell you the same thing, but, but ultimately like, you know, that's what I, I brought to the table. But I also 
I pushed the envelope on things that I thought that, that I thought needed to change. And I wasn't going to sit back and, and, and let people tell me what we could do and what we couldn't do. I think I had ideas around what I wanted to change. And I think that opportunity allowed me to really flex the muscle of, hey, I see, an, I see a great opportunity to lead a, a good group of people to change things for the better and ultimately put myself in a position to where I can have a stronger network. Um, and by doing that, it, it allowed me to have all those things. And, you know, I think I learned a lot. I was extremely <laughs> egotistical back then. And I, I think that that helped me understand <laughs> that ego can get ahead of you and be a problem. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, you, you learn things very young and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but you learn, learn stuff when you're young that you carry forever. And, and, uh, I think when you're in your first leadership positions, you learn so much and you mm. usually learn it by looking back and go, Oh my God, that was, that was super cringy. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, that, that's, that's my thought around that. No, my, my favorite thing about that story, which I've found really surprising doing this podcast is the, um, <laughs> the sort of motivation behind going for class president. I, I love that mm -hmm. you were like, okay, get the scholarship for basketball. And then you're there and you're like, oh, okay, I actually don't want to do this. I'd better do something else. Um, you know, or my parents, my parents are going to kill me. Probably, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, I'm always shocked at um, how often the, the motivations initially when people first get a leadership opportunity, like I had someone um, one time, I just remember who like, I, I can't remember who it was actually, but they're doing amazing things now, like leading an incredibly successful leader. And their, their comment to this like question was, well, I was in this role and um, my boss tried to like promote a bunch of people and they all said no. And so I was like <laughs> the last on the list. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was just so funny that it was like the boss was like, oh, fine. Okay. I'll ask this person. And now they've proven to be um, a great leader. And, and so I think it's, it should be encouraging, particularly for young, uh, young leaders that particularly when you're starting out, I think sometimes we try to really like when you're, when you're 18 or 19, we, we overthink it. It's like, or when you're in your twenties, just like go out there and try things and give it a go and step into things and why you do it and why other people give you the chance doesn't matter as much as just going and, 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 and doing it almost. Yep. Well, I, I, I would agree with you. And I think that early leaders, um, you know, you're, you're kind of acting, you're, it's like an acting class you know you're like you you've picked the leader that you want to be and in my case you know the leader that i really adored back then was bobby knight you know bobby knight was just completely outspoken and an absolute maniac you know he was he's one of the you know he was a, he was the coach at, at west point and then he was the coach basketball coach for the indiana hoosiers you know during their title title runs in the 80s and so i was just you know a huge bobby knight fan i thought that's how leaders were you know he was bombastic he was just loud and aggressive and throwing chairs and it's like and i look back on that i go wow i was just like pretending to be that leader during this time when i actually you know hadn't really found myself as a leader and and that takes time you know and again to your point you got to try things out and you have to see like mm. who are the leaders that you really truly and in, early on, you're almost like, who do you want to act like? Because you don't know how to do it, right? So you kind of have to <laughs> yeah. figure out who's your, like, beacon that you want to, like, use as your template of leadership. Um, and that not many, many people talk about that, right? When you get into these leadership, especially leading professionals, and especially leading mm. people that are older than yeah. you, right? And more seasoned than you. Yeah. Like, you, <laughs> you have to – and they'll see through all this stuff. So the question is, is, like – what is the template that you're going to use in order to be a great leader? And I think those that, that do well um, are, are those that come up with their, their own style, but it's also borrowed yes. from, from a lot of different, oh, yeah. uh, a lot of different leaders that you've either had or you've researched. And, you know, I would say that that's, that's mm -hmm. how I've been able to structure mine. Yeah. You, that reminded me of, I, I, I remember a, having there was a leader who really um i found really inspirational and really uh helped me but they were super charismatic very charismatic very um like really sort of wildly confident and and charismatic that was their style and because it helped me i assumed that's what 
I, I just thought mm. that's my template, right? I probably didn't think of it like that, but I just went, okay, well, that's how you help people. And then I remember doing some presentations and things where I sort of tried to be like that. And I realized, wow, this, this, this is really not me. Like I'm really bad at that. <laughs> like yeah. I can not pull that off. And I didn't know that. So that was actually a really hard, like, I remember um, one of the best things I ever did was film myself or get someone to film me doing like a presentation. And I always say this mm. to, to people um, is, you know, film yourself, anything you want to get better at that's communication or anything, film and record yourself and then force yourself to sit through yourself <laughs> actually presenting or something. And when I did that, I went, oh, wow, this is, this is painful because it's just not me. And that was the start. It was really unpleasant realizing that because at yeah. the time I probably thought I'm just a failure because I can't lead. I didn't realize that that was just one style, one template, like you said. But after that, I started, I started, uh, yeah, I guess looking at other styles, I started getting more comfortable with me not being that type of style. And then as I embraced who I am, particularly if we stick with, say, just presenting, I mm -hmm. love, I really found a, a passion for storytelling and yeah. just having my own, like, which is where, you know, this podcast is really an extension of that initial sort of um, seed that was planted around, oh, well, what if I just get up and share stories in a really um, more relaxed, informal, rather than this like wildly charismatic, just be myself. And sure. boom, that's when I found I was really connecting with people. So, uh, but yeah, no one told me about that. And I, and, I, and I remember when I first watched myself back and went, I'm, it was more like I realized I just, it's one thing to think you're not good at something now, but when you actually have that aha moment where you go, I don't think I could ever nail that style of leadership. Mm -hmm. That really hit me hard at first. I mean, I can tell you looking back at, at that, you know, that version of me in, as an 18 year old, you know, it's a completely different version than it is now. And, you know, as, as a person, as a, as you know, a personal side of things, as well as a professional side of things. Um, but, you know, I had no idea. Yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, and, and you know, you, you get motivated by your heroes. And, you know, you, you have to be careful, too, because at the time, the, those that are influencing you that are your heroes might not be the the 30 or the 40 year old Eric's heroes that they're going to idolize. You know, like I wrote my college essay on notorious big like my hero was biggie smalls and it's like is can i like at 42 years old can i say that B biggie is my number one here no absolutely not <laughs> like so it, it's yeah. you just have to understand that it's like you are going to change as a human professionally and, and and personally over time and you have to change your heroes and you have to change those that are influencing you because that ultimately gets you into a place to where you're more well-rounded and, and you are more relatable to people. And so when you have more mm. experiences, especially more, and I call it about being, being the chameleon, right? If, if you look at the four mm. animal traits and we do this all the time in the business, businesses I've worked at is that, you know, you have your lion, you have your eagle, you have your turtle and you have your chameleon. And we all identify who we are in these businesses. And nine times out of 10, all the salespeople are going to the chameleons. They're either lions or the chameleons, right? And entrepreneurs generally are, are either lions or, or, or chameleons. Um, there are some turtles out there that are in kind of non client facing like data-based organizations. But anyway, long and short of it is that the more experiences you have with these different heroes and templates, you know, not saying that I, I don't, I still like Biggie and Tupac define who I, I was from a grit perspective, right? Like I kind of mm. love the way that they hustled and like that, like that eighties, mm nineties -hmm. hip hop style and the hustle behind it. Yeah. They were slanging drugs and like doing really bad stuff, but it was a hustle. And I, and I, you take that, but then you, you realize as you start to move along and you, you have other heroes like Obama or you have other heroes like Reed Hoffman or, or, or Mark Benioff and now Manny Medina at Outreach, who's, who's a big hero, my a close friend of mine. You know, like these guys have shaped the way I am as a professional now because now my heroes are very much in, in the professional realm or the, you know, the political realm or, you know, on the, on the nonprofit mm. realm. So, or the inventor realm. Right. And so I've, I've kind of 
advanced yeah. as we've gone along, but that allows me to connect with people and that and living everywhere that I have, like also allows me to connect with people because <laughs> how do you connect with people? Well, you connect with them based on where they live, what their interests are, yeah. and then ultimately what their career is. And I think that, you know, if you can have more well-roundedness in those three areas, then you, you get to a position to where it's very easy to have conversations with anybody. Uh, and that allows you to, to be a great leader, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love how you articulated the different heroes you had at different points in your life and how they shaped you at that point um, in, in a good way. Um, and uh, I'm interested to know in terms of mentors or great leaders along the way that you've really looked up to um, in your journey so far, Eric, uh, you know, people you've worked with, or like you said, people you've watched from afar and just um, seen how they've handled a difficult moment or seen how they've, how they've been successful. Um, what are some, uh, yeah, who are some of those key mentors? You might've already mentioned, mentioned them just then, but who are some of the key sort of mentors that you've admired? Uh, in yeah, I mean, journey so, far? so, you know, on, I'll, I'll give you the, the professional ones cause the personal ones are, are different, but, um, you know, the professional ones, I very kind of early on in my career, um, when I, so first off, came out of school saying, I'm going to be a management consultant. I'm going to work for Arthur Anderson. You know, I'm going to go, you know, be a management consultant, you know, help companies be more productive. And lo and behold, when I was interviewing Enron and Arthur Anderson went down in flames. So that didn't happen. Uh, and then... And then after college, you know, I, I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is, and obviously September 11th had happened and it was horrible. And we were trying to figure out, everybody was just figuring out what was going on. And you know, that's for another story. But um, I decided that, you know, I wasn't going to be in management consulting. I was going to be a salesperson, you know, and I, I, and I got into sales and I started executing, you know, sales. But then very early on, I was just like, man, all of these people that are getting so rich are, are making things, they're inventing things. And so when I started looking at technology as a, sex, a sector of inventions and who are the greatest inventors within software businesses, just specifically not the B2C side, but the B2B side of things, you know, I, I was really, uh, I was obviously a huge Steve Jobs fan um, and loved his story and how disruptive he was to the status quo. And at the same time, I love Bill Gates' story and how buttoned up and how thoughtful he was about the actual technology. And it was like these two amazing minds that were creating this, you know, this incredible opportunity, which was the the personal computer and, and the ability to, you know, basically digitize work. And so I thought that was you know, I, I thought those two guys were kind of like the foundation of, of who I loved. And then when you looked at, that was kind of the hardware and the software piece, but when you actually looked at workflow tools and how people were doing work, as a salesperson, I was an early adopter of salesforce.com. I started using salesforce.com in 2004, um, when it was salesforce.com. And so, you know, we were probably wow. one of like the first, I was probably one of the first thousand users on that platform. And I was so amazed that you could do all of this on the cloud that I, I ended up interviewing with Salesforce in downtown San Francisco at their first office. Now, you know, I met with like some of the leadership and I got, I saw Mark, Mark Benioff walk by and I was just enamored and ended up not getting the job, which was fine. But it set me on this path going like, these guys are doing something completely different. And this feels a lot like the early days of Apple. It feels just like, they're onto this thing that has massive total addressable market. And like, and they're the only ones really working on it this way. Sure. Oracle had been around and Larry did a great job with building that organization. And, you know, from a hardware on-prem standpoint, but when you actually looked at where things were going, I thought Mark did an amazing job. I also thought at the time that with Reed Hoffman and starting LinkedIn after PayPal, which, you know, all these guys came from PayPal, like they're just the PayPal army. Right. So the amount of talent, that got pushed out of that organization. You just look at how many amazing businesses have been created by Peter Thiel, by <laughs> by by Elon, by Reed. But I mean, you just go down the list and it's like by Mark, all of these guys were at PayPal. And it's like, so they got they got it right. Like that whoever the leaders there were of who were educating those guys and 
that's they got it right because they created so much opportunity for 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 growth and for development and inventions anyway so you know tracking mm. linkedin tracking uh, Salesforce, you know, I thought those businesses did incredibly well, you know, scaling became obviously multi-billion dollar organizations. And then my friend, you know, Manny came along with Outreach IO, which is, you know, a sales engagement platform that is killing it here, which is essentially kind of the next Salesforce, I believe. You know, I, I, I met Manny about six years ago, seven years ago, and he pitched me on Outreach, which is, you know, sequential management of all of your sales activities and then reporting and the ability to track it all in one place and then execute that. And it was an HR sourcing tool that he had created, but he had flipped it into the sales tool. And I just thought that, you know, he, he was one of those very charismatic people, but he was real. Like he was just a real human being. And so when I was starting my adventure as an entrepreneur and, you know, he had, he, would, he was kind of building outreach, you know, he, he allowed me to really learn how to be extremely extremely agile and listen to customers and understand how to execute business models and how to recruit and mm. form relationships and challenge people without burning them you know it's like all these things a lot of what i got was was from manny and and, and i would have to say that like it was <laughs> it went back and forth i also you know was a big advisor for, for him early days of, of outreach and challenged him of how they were building the software how VPs of sales would actually execute and use the platform. And, you know, that defined a lot of, you know, those conversations with me and other advisors to find what that became. And, you know, so I, I do the same thing with Postal, did the same thing with my last business, Text Recruit. But we, you know, you have to surround yourself with just amazing people if you can. And if, and if you don't have the connections, just work on it. And, you know, if, yeah. if for the folks that are listening out there, dude, if, if you guys want to be an entrepreneur, an amazing leader, Go find a hundred amazing entrepreneurs that are on LinkedIn or leaders that you admire and send them a note. One will get back to you. I promise. Mm -hmm. I promise. And yeah. you can, you can <laughs> hit me up. I might not be able to have the time to speak, but I will promise you, I will get back to you. I always respond to every single person that, that hits me up on LinkedIn. So anyway, there is opportunity to learn out there. There is commonality. Mm -hmm. There is a playbook like that is out there of how to start a business, mm -hmm. how to raise capital, how to execute the business. Mm -hmm. It's going to be different for a lot of people because not everybody's the same. But after you've gone through it, and this will be my fourth one, it, you kind of see the same things in each one of these businesses. And so, you know, you have to make sure that you surround yourself with great people in order to, to be successful and get to where, where you want to be. Yeah, that's so that's so good. Um, I have so many questions. I've just got to pick one because there's so many good things you just shared there. Um, in terms of what you learned from Manny, are there, are there any stories uh, working with or, or um, th that would be appropriate to share of, of watching how Manny uh, dealt with things um, that have really like ingrained in your memory as just wonderful stories of... Uh, of navigating tricky situations or, or approaching things with a particular value. Any stories from, from that uh, relationship? Yeah. So I can think of a, a perfect one that's uh, it, when you said it, I was like, Oh, this time. Um, and so, uh, you know, every leader is going to be different with the, that you were talking about being char charismatic and like being almost like a hypnotist. Like some people just have the ability to just, motivate and captivate audiences and you know some of us are really good at it some are, are not great and some i lead i lead with humility and comedy that's kind of how i roll in sarcasm a lot and you know I, I i try to make sure that that what i'm saying and how i'm saying it you know will ensure that we that we touch all the audience and, and everybody can really extract the most important things um but Manny is one of those folks where he walks into a room and it's like the energy of the room just blows up. And so I went up for one of their kickoffs and it was early on. They probably had a hundred employees and they were in, uh, they were above Brooks um, athletic shoes in, in Seattle. And I'd flown up there and I was meeting with the team and we were doing like a fireside chat. At the time I was the VP of sales at Reich and had also started text recruit uh, on the side and essentially, you know, they were just talking to me about, you know, running and building large sales teams and how we were doing that off of outreach. And when, when I walked in 
and everybody started like gathering like Manny walked in and like everybody stood up and was clapping and he was he was giving everybody pounds and high fives and everybody was so fired up. It was like, I have never, I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> like, like I'm pretty, like, I have a lot of energy. I like to light up a room too. I'm a big, I'm a big kind of force when I walk in and like, you know, I get people fired up. I'm like a coach. I'm like, here we go. But this was like, like amazing. And it was like palpable. And so you walk in and I was just like, what the, is this like a cult? Like, what, what is happening? And it's funny because I'm watching We Crashed about Aaron Newman, Adam Newman, which, by the way, Adam is, was the same exact way, only, unfortunately, he didn't make the right decisions and became extremely egotistical. But at the end of the day, Manny has the same ability to do that. And so I knew that I had to have some of that. I had to figure out how to get that. And for me, you know, I, I continue to work mm. on listening to people, forming relationships, making sure there's no glass ceiling, ensuring that, ensuring that we don't not, not only like seek diversity, that it happens, right? So ensuring that what you have is not just a cookie cutter of everybody that, you know, was once a Silicon Valley person, yeah. which by the way, you know, the Patagonia vest <laughs> and the, you know, and, and the, you know, white sneakers, whatever. Dude, that's, that's long gone. Like if you don't have 50% women on your staff and a diverse workforce, you know, like you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and so mm -hmm. we've been not, not thoughtful about that. We've been, we do it like we do it. And so you have to be able to connect with people and you have to show them that, Hey, the people that we have here are like you and that we are here to help you. And we are all here to help our customers. And we listen and we learn and we iterate and build and sell. And if we're all here having fun, making money and learning, then this is a good place to be. And I think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that dude, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to earn, learn and have fun. Yeah, that's so good. That, I love that story. Um, what, what have you come up with since then about how to create uh, because like you said, it sounds like some of that's very natural for Manny. So what have you learned about how to um, intentionally that leaders listening might be able to implement to actually create some of that energy, create some of that um, true authentic um, excitement and, and inspiration when you not only when you walk into a room, but when you're leading, uh, you know, a bunch of people? Yeah, I mean... I think you have to just be, you have to have clear and radical transparency and candor. Okay. So there can't be anything that that's floating around that could t potentially be negative of for someone's experience at the business. Um, and so, you know, we have to, as leaders ensure that we're going out of our way to try to create relationships with the lowest level or lowest compensated person in the business to the highest, right? And and your and your board and your investors. Like, if you were to ask me, what is my relationship with, like, our board in relation to what is my relationship with our interns? I'd have to say it's the same. Like, they know me on the first name basis. They've got my cell phone number. They can come into my office whenever they want. The interns might actually have more access to me than our, than our board, right? Because we're on a daily basis. So it's so it's like <laughs> yeah, we yeah. and 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 we're not we're a hundred you know hundred twenty person organization now. And and so and unfortunately I can't you know I can't even meet everybody during the interview process anymore. And that was one of my core things. But you know we're we're growing so fast that eventually you just you kind of grow out of that. So that's and that's a real challenge because you want to form relationships with people you want them to know that your door is open and that i am here to help you and if i'm here to help you then you're going to be here to help the customers and and that as a leader you know when you have a business that's got product market fit and you've got funding and you've got a good structure and your culture is where it needs to be and you're just attacking this opportunity that you see forward that everyone believes in it's really yours to fuck up. <laughs> Sorry for cursing, but it is. No, it's all good. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> when you get those Sorry, building it's, blocks it's right, the, the rest of yeah, it flows. It's the... 
Oops, sorry, I have my, my someone's calling me. Actually, it's funny enough, my investor is calling me right now. <laughs> so, okay. so, which That's is point. very, <laughs> it must be, it, I, this must be bugged. I always say he calls right in the middle of stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> that, that, that being said, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really important. It's really important to make sure that you understand that you're open and transparent with everybody. Mm -hmm. That they have the open door. So, yeah. So I, I'm interested, um, uh, I guess the, the last question before I jump into Leadership Express, Eric, I'm just enjoying this so much. Um, uh, can you think of any of your own aha moments in the past few years where something that really um, has taught you a leadership lesson where, where something happened and either it went really well or it went really poorly and you just remember what you learned from that situation is something you'll never forget? Anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think that you have points in your career that are those that um, they're kind of like the low points of your career. And and you want to, I mean, your, your natural like human standpoint on this is that I want to bury those things. I, I Like I want to move on for those things. But I really think that the the biggest failures in your career are your biz biggest successes. I really do believe that. So, you know, getting demoted um, and, you know, and, and, and fired from a leadership position at one of my earlier jobs was like <laughs> pretty big shot. It was a pretty big shot to the ego and a pretty big shot to just mm -hmm. not only ego, just like, is this even meant for me? Am I supposed to be a lone wolf? Should I just be out there selling and, you know, is that my career? And which is the, not a problem, by the way. Many people have made amazing careers around around that path. But really, I wanted to be a leader. I, I thought I was doing a great job, but but I wasn't playing the political game in this certain company that would allow me to to move <laughs> forward. And so, never been good at that. By the way, I I, I don't enjoy the political aspects because I I really think it's unnecessary. Um, and so, yeah, you know, that learning really helped, I think, me create the foundation that I'm not going to be like these guys. I'm going to be different. I'm mm -hmm. going to create organizations that are intrinsic and that, you know, are inclusive and allow for, for growth. And if there's ever an issue, then we really try to manage people up and try to get them into a success because they invested their time in this. We shouldn't invest our, our time in them. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's very much those low points. And I think getting terminated or getting demoted, you know, you're mm -hmm. going to go through that in your life. And you know, if you haven't gone through that, yeah. that sucks because you that feeling of being rejected mm -hmm. at the professional level, when you invest yeah. so much time and effort into it is worse than a breakup it's worse than a personal breakup because you're like, Oh my God, this is my livelihood. Like, what am I going to do? So yeah. Yeah. Any, anyway. Yeah. No, that, that really resonates with me. I, I appreciate you sharing that so vulnerably. And uh, you know, I think of the same um, type of principle in my own life where the biggest stuff up I ever made as a leader was in how I dealt with some people that I was finding really difficult on my team. And I just, I think the hardest thing for me is I, I really care so deeply about people and wanting to do, wanting to really um, invest in people. Um, and, you know, that's what I, that's what I'm so passionate about now and always have been. And, but I just stuffed this up. I, I did, I did things the right outcome with the completely wrong process and it just hurt a lot of people. And I remember, um, you know, I, I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I was actually sitting under a tree uh, crying because by myself, which I don't do very often. Um, yep. and I just, yeah. was so I was, I was just so frustrated because I felt like I'd really hurt people and I hadn't done it on purpose. Like I really felt like I'd tried to do the right thing and it had just blown up and gone so poorly. And I would never want to be sitting there again, you know, cause it was so painful. And yet that was, that was where, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I do now with leaders is help them work out how to deal really well with difficult situations and difficult conversations and difficult people. 
um, and that's where I wrote my book out of. And mm -hmm. so it's so funny that it's funny now, not at the time, but I think you do need to like, you know, and, and, you know, coming back to what we said right at the start of this episode is I only stuffed up like that because I did take a chance to accept a role that in some ways I didn't know what I was doing at different times. Mm. And so it's in the failing and the, those moments where you feel shattered. Like I just felt like, um, the ultimate failure as a leader and just knowing I'd really hurt people, but I, I it just, it was so deeply painful for me. Um, and that's probably one of the most formative and one of the best things that's ever happened to me. So I think, um, I think it's really hard on the other side of that though, right? Like it's hard when you're oh, the yeah. one who is in the middle of getting terminated or in the middle of making a monumental mistake, and, and, but you're doing your best. Um, but yeah, I and you have I to be that. thoughtful. I love that you brought that up. Yeah, you have to, I mean, you have to be thoughtful around that when you're on the other side too. And so that allows you also, when you've had that experience and you've, and you've had those tears and that, that, that just, just complete devastated feeling around being a failure. Cause that's, you failed. You, I mean, you were a failure in what you were doing. That's really what happened. And like, whether it was deemed you're a failure mm. by what your actions were or by somebody's interpretation of your actions or whatever else it is, it, it didn't work. Right. Which is yeah. a, a, essentially the definition yeah. of it. So that yeah. being said, it really helps you understand on the other side of the table, how to lead with empathy. And when you think about lead with empathy, it's such a huge topic now with all of the different, you know, generations that are working together, which is really the first time ever that we've seen this many so defined generations that are so incredibly different. Like how empathy is literally the only thing that can get you through managing all these different cultures and all these different generations and all this different emotion. And so, and it's very difficult for folks that grew up in a more kind of militaristic background, very focused, very like, you know, structured mm -hmm. because there really wasn't a lot of empathy back then. It was like, do it or else, you know? And it's like, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And I don't think we're ever going mm -hmm. back to that working ever again. So you also have to understand that the like, sensitivity of people is increasing too. And I think that, and be, you know, call it woke, whatever, I think all that stuff is extremely important. You need to understand that what you say has an incredible impact in people. They will take it home. They will think about it. They will tell their parents about it. They will tell their girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever. They'll tell people about it. They will develop, people will develop a, a profile of you as a leader, even if you don't want to, it's happening, right? So what is your profile going to be? <laughs> who are you going to be? Mm. Not of who you think you are, but who other people think you are as a leader. And that become, that is defined of how you treat your, your individual you know, direct reports, their direct reports, how can you ensure you get that? And I'm telling you, man, that if you don't have that right, if you don't have that right, that is when work becomes extremely difficult because you are working against yeah. the tide. You are trying yeah. to swim up the current and it is going to kill you if you don't do that. And that's how important it is because that current at some point, yeah. it might be your business and you might be the leader or you might be the leader of this team and this is your business unit and it doesn't matter. It never works. You could fire that whole entire, you know, that everybody that's pushing against you, get another you know, boat in there mm. and then the same thing is going to happen unless you learn and change mm -hmm. and, and really lead with empathy. And, um, and that's, we absolutely try to do that here. Um, and yeah, we hold mm -hmm. people accountable. That's not like, don't hold people accountable and, you know, make sure that you're working people through, you know, the, the development. And if they can't get to where they need to be, obviously it's a difficult conversation, but you've given them the chance you've managed with empathy and you're ensure that you're trying to make them successful. If they can't change, it is what it is yeah. and you have to move on. It's business, but you, there's a place to get there. There's a way to get there. And I think that that has inherently changed yes. dramatically over the last 20 years. Um, and we've seen it, you know, being, being leaders now in this uh, generation. I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you remind me of uh, one of my favorite books, Blue Ocean Strategy, which is all about 
you know, uh, in, innovating with how we do strategic planning and rethinking strategic planning. And it's, it's not, it's not a new book. It's been around probably 15, 20 years now, but they talk yeah. about this idea in the book that really implementation, execution, transformation, seeing all of that stuff actually happen comes back to fair process. And that's what I learned about say, dealing with people that I was finding really um, difficult is I didn't, I didn't do a fair process in from their shoes in their perspective and as soon as someone feels like the process is unfair you Mm -hmm. you lose them and i think that is really hard to stomach particularly when you're a leader you need to be moving fast you you feel like um you're sure sometimes you know where you need to go and what the outcome is and so you're just looking at people going come on just get on board um but what they want is they want a fair process which is what i I feel like empathy creates that right empathy if i if i truly believe you understand me you get me that you're not just using me but you actually yes care about me even even if it's a difficult conversation as long as i feel there's empathy and it's a fair process things go infinitely better as soon as it's unfair or perceived as unfair you, you lose you lose so much and you start fighting um, against the current. Like you said, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Well, I mean, then you start using authoritarianism and, and, and it gets even worse. You know, it's like, if you just, you know, it's like you, you, you move towards the stick and not the carrot, which is a little different, you know, that's incentivizing people and, and how to, how to, you know, get them to have the best output. But, you know, when you move too far off that, off that, um, the carrot and the empathy and understanding of how to make people successful and grow and you move to the stick, it's like, you know, you're going to have people, generally everybody wants to be motivated, but everybody's motivated by carrots. Everybody's carrot, right? No one anymore is stick. I mean, sure. Like there are some people that are like, Hey, Mm. tell me how it is. I want to do better. You know, hit me with a stick. Let's go. I'm ready. Sure. But it's not like they love it. So, so it's yeah. like, you have to like, and you can't rely, especially if you're failing and you're swimming up the current. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you have to, you're, you're switching to the authoritarianism and, and, and you're trying to lead people through fear. You're, you're in a bad position, man. You're, you're, you're in a bad position and you're not going to win. Even if you're having short-term gains, the long-term is not going to be there. So. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree. Well, um, Eric, I would love to invite you back for another um, episode. I have just enjoyed your stories and, and chatting with you about leadership so much that I'm looking at the clock and um, maybe we can uh, get you back down the track at some point, no rush, um, and do Leadership Express um, and, and ask you a bunch of those questions another time. So the the invitation is uh, is there. It would be great to, to catch up another time. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, I, I enjoyed the conversation and you know, leadership's hard. This is this this is a topic that everyone's trying to figure out. We've been trying to figure out forever, um, and I think everybody just needs yeah. to figure out you know, what is best for them. And I think you're doing a great job with, you know, challenging people of of you know, what is going to be their their template and, and how are they going to move forward. So, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, as we said earlier, for those who have listened to you and just heard about uh, Postal.io and are going, hmm, maybe this is what we've been looking for um for us uh where can people find you online and also where can they find out more about postal.io yeah feel free to connect with me on linkedin um fairly active there since 100 percent of all of our target audience is uh, is on on there all our marketing and sales folks that we sell to um and then postal.io is the website um we just recently acquired postal.com as well so you'll be seeing that shortly but uh yeah you can hit us up there mm-hmm. and learn more about the business and and how we're helping companies with um, omni-channel approach with marketing and, and uh, creating engagements that are in the offline. Love it. Well, um, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Uh, this has been so much fun, just great stories, great uh, leadership principles. Uh, just just really love today. Don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, two other places you can go um, to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying, A massive thank you to you, Eric, for being so generous with your time, for telling such great stories and um, just for sharing your wisdom with us. You really got me thinking some of the things you've you've shared today uh, in the best way possible, like really good, good challenging to to, to remind us to challenge ourselves. So um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Jenna.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.